Conservation is the art of the possible. I have always regarded the tiger as a means to an end and not an end in itself. And I regard the cheetah as a means to another end. The Wildlife Protection Act, which is one of the better things I've done in life, should be strengthened and not weakened. Period. Grasslands are universally, the world over, and particularly in India, the most productive ecosystem, terrestrial ecosystem. But at the same time, there is a conflict of interest in man because they are also the agricultural land. For over millennia, man has developed, have diverted grasslands into. And I am talking about not just. Uh, uh, high grasslands, low grasslands, even wetlands and, and areas, all of them have been diverted for agriculture and human existence, habitation. As it, this is understandable. Now, whatever remained, at the turn, uh, when we became independent, we had a grow more food scheme because we were short of uh, we were important grain. Therefore, the available grasslands were given away. We have the largest livestock population in the world. They graze on communal land, on government land, and then on private land also. But it is mainly almost entirely free grazing. So they are grazing what are called range lands. Therefore, you need to have a, a regulation of the graze land. The thing is, if you do not graze them during the growing period, you allow the grasses to grow, then you cut them and harvest them and, and stack them. That was the whole practice. They were your fodder banks, like your money banks. They were useful in the dry season. They were useful when there was a famine and the rains failed. After that, you grazed. What would happen is those animals and birds who were grass laid would have laid the, uh, their, their young or their eggs during the monsoon or period. After the Diwali period and the grass is dry, you cut them. By that time, the chicks would have gone and the animals would have, the, those who lay their young would have taken away. I'm talking about old, uh, high grass, medium grass, short grass. What happens after uh, I think, the cattle and sheep and goats mm -hmm. were allowed to graze after the winter crop was over? There was a period before the other grasses, before the monsoon came and the monsoon crops were started. During that period, the cattle used to go and graze on private land. Livestock used to graze. It used to allow them to to graze and the droppings of the thing, nourish the ground, if many are. Um, so, it was beneficial both ways. Now, um, now the uh, what has happened is that they can't go into grassland, they can't go into croplands because of crops being there on the monsoon. And because the grazing area has become very small. There is overcrowding of cattle in the remaining grasslands. Therefore, everything is grazed. And the ground laying birds have their eggs and chicks trampled over by cows and, and buffaloes. So, there is a drop even in the breeding uh, in the population of birds, ground laying birds, sand grouse, partridges, quail, everything. And then it's set fire to get fresh grass, which kills things. Tortoises. You see a tiger. When did you see a last wild tortoise? They've gone. So, so, this is what is happening. We need to have, we need a grassland policy as much as we need a, a, um, a forest policy. And I've been trying for a grassland policy for years and years. But 
that would mean regulation of grassland it mm. would mean loss of votes mm. and in a democracy the most important thing is votes more important than fortunately than governance than good governance and therefore the grassland has paid that price there are also grasslands along rivers which are not very nutritive which are very useful for uh, providing cover for breeding for the hog deer you see if one tiger dies outside of cobra national park it makes it to the front page of the times of india and why not but if an entire species of grass dependent animal goes extinct in india no tear will be shed there are now less than 20 hog deer left when i first went to kana uh, to kobet in 1962 uh, there were more hog deer than cheetah but they gone because we didn't manage the grassland even in a national park we burnt them we submerged a lot because of the ramganga dam and the rest we burnt because we had to show the tiger and the elephant to the visitors that is myopic okay. that is criminal no grazing from the moment a little before the rain starts till after the grass is cut you will provide labor there used to be a special community who used to be grass cutters lodhas in in gujarat they used to cut the grass and they before the grass was cut they, in the monsoonal period they would do weeding of uh, the uh, uh, fields or private land for, and get paid for it then they would uh, cut the grass after the grass was stacked in hay stacks they would then go and uh, do the weeding in the winter crops and then do the harvesting of the winter and then the whole cycle that community is now extinct mm. because there is no labor because of mechanization and because of the fact that there are no grasslands so firstly if you would allow uh, the uh, grassland to grow that would mean firstly regulation of uh, the season of grazing and the quantum of number of animals this is the problem ye is area mein itne hi graze kar sakte this is the carrying capacity every grassland would have its carrying capacity that in this only 400 cattle can graze or 600 um, sheep or goats or whatever it has to have that kind of management plan mm. and they had to be implemented it cannot be on paper so if you do that you can have it on a priority and what will happen is this the ad it has been found and in an area in sivni some years ago when they did not allow grazing during the monsoonal period only in 3 years the quantum of grass increased by 20 by 18%. This is one study but it's there are other study. They it grew at increased by 18% quantum wise. Mm-hmm. You know weight wise. Now the protein contents increase from 3 to 7%. to 23 to 26%. look at the difference in quality and the quantity you can have more provided you manage them properly but we are not allowed to manage them because of the political of the because of the human pressure which is patronized by the by the edp we have a forest policy but do you think it is being entirely observed the forest policy also says this that it is the goal of india to increase the forest area of this country from 
23.24.6% which was figure relative to 33% one third of the total area we have not achieved it we have decreased and the government has taken the ploy of showing areas that forest is increasing from satellite imagery what is increased is tree cover and tree cover also includes orchards eucalyptus plantation and and prosopis juliflora which is a weed if you ask them to go into forest cover you ask them there are three categories uh, high uh, uh, density what is called uh, canopy high canopy medium canopy low canopy you ask them what is the improvement in the canopy level is come down but government doesn't say so, and people don't know and sir what according to you would be the best preserved grasslands in the country now in the middle of national parks and sanctuaries would be kaziranga kana to some extent corbett to some extent dudwa um and there are others and also also in the south on the western ghat um nilgiris um ravikulo conservation is like art it's the art it's like any 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 walk of life uh administration management and conservation is the art of the possible you say ye mat karo ye kariye for that avoid this we are saying in some cases like the public interest litigation which i and my other colleagues won against the government uh, uh two years ago the bastard great indian bastard which is the heaviest fight with the state bird of rajasthan the biggest mortality cause is hitting with power lines they don't have frontal vision they have side vision and they collide and die with overhead power we don't say don't take power we are not saying don't supply to the villages we are saying in the areas where they are breeding the lost last 2 3 um, uh, breeding areas take them underground take them underground you know how much it costs for taking underground it costs a little about a crore to take it underground but once it's underground there is no maintenance there is no loss of electricity chori or nothing and it is a long term investment it's costly as i said but look at it this point of view it's a cost which is preventing them from doing it but the law enjoins that the profit from the profit that any company any commercial company 2% must go for csr activity there are over 100 power line companies operating in the only in the great indian busted area of the country mm. over 100 16 of them declared 2 years ago 16 only out of the 104 that in one year they had earned 29600 rupees profit after paying all taxes what is 2% of that 2% of that is almost 600 crores for 600 crores of only those 16 companies you could take all the lines underground mm-hmm. they don't want to spend that and therefore in disobedience of the order of the supreme court the lines are still overhead and the bustards are dying lot of other birds are dying and the supreme court orders are being disobeyed would you call that rule of law
there are two three objectives large objectives behind the project tiger one is the restoration of a lost species as i would say the loss uh, the restoration of the prodigal son of india mm. one but with the species comes something much more important than that and that is the the changing of the focus from the tiger and the rhinoceros and to some extent the elephant and the lion to something much larger which is again the most productive ecosystems and it's not just grassland it is it is the grassland forest mosaics like i use the uh, snow leopard to shift the focus on to the mountains like we try to do it in the case of shifting focus to the wetland and the river and areas because of the river and uh, the gangetic dolphin and the rest which has become a aquatic animal of the country and that way to take the focus over into the grassland forest mosaics and a different kind of ecotypes and thereby to shift focus onto the other grassland dependent species which are very very endangered the caracal is the most endangered mammal in india with it also comes the desert cat the great indian bustard the lesser florican and there are others to shift focus to that and to bring thereby an attention to the need to manage our grassland i have always regarded the tiger as a means to an end and not an end in itself and i regard the cheetah as a means to another end they have become um islands surrounded by sea of humanity and the same um drawbacks and and fears that are existent with what is called island biogeography island may there are number of things that happen one is the extinction is far greater because there is no way to take it spread secondly there is what is called an island attenuation over over century wo invading se the size of the animal and therefore their capacity of propagation everything decreases so and there is no way where can we can much as we would like to have the continuity and we have been trying to get these corridors of connectivity it's very difficult to secure them um uh, with the with the increase in population pressure demands and the increase in the requirements of man so as i said those are the little islands where not just the fauna or the flora but the biodiversity and hence the national natural heritage of india will survive on a long term basis and therefore the, in those areas the conservation interest should be paramount you can have and uh, it is necessary to have a uh, buffer area around it where you can allow um a dual uh, utilization usage where man can use it for grazing for forest uh, produce collection etc if there are people existing inside they must get the basic amenities of life as i said and if you provide them with that roads infrastructure um facilities there is also a disturbance factor and there is an impact so you cannot deny them these basic rights so it's in their interest that they stay where they can get full rights you can't in nature you can't always or almost always have the cake and eat it too so that is one part of the story then comes the other thing of what are called linear um intrusion into protected area always keeping in mind that our areas are small and isolated 
now if uh, you are allowing the amount of usage may be very small the um, uh, amount taken for roads or railway may be very small in area but the impact is huge a because it divides the area and animals need to to uh, move from one to other they also um, uh, cause a tremendous amount of disturbance and in the case of roads at night particularly but mm. daytime also you have accidents and it's the animals who suffer and the cars also therefore those areas should be kept sacrosanct and it is in the interest of human uh, inhabitant to be uh, outside of that area so that those areas are safe and it's not just human existence it's human presence picking up that causes uh, for instance the collection of uh, salsi the collection of uh, hindu patta people move out of that mm-hmm. but they set fire to that area and fire is very dangerous it spreads grazing grazing causes uh, um, a degradation of the area of the soil of the land and it it poses man animal conflict because they will be killed by tigers and leopards so you have this conflict is therefore whatever people may say they may be well meaning people but it does amount to <coughs> to exclusion of human in certain areas and we are only talking about what 2 or 3% of uh, the area of the whole country 4% at the maximum is that too much of a price to pay don't you also set aside in a in a inhabited area certain areas where people are not allowed to build houses like parks like uh, recreational areas like temples and mosques and if you are allowing temples and mosques are they not these also temples and mosques of god we are talking about the the um, the um, uh, security of the nation from foreign aggression and this is extremely important what about ecological security which is important for every day survival and for the prosperity of man including uh, the the availability of potable water which is the most second most important uh, gift of uh, mother nature after oxygen water comes from those areas of protected areas and at least the catchment areas of those must be secured and the most effective way of securing them is through establishing protected areas because the rest i see very little hope because human population will increase and uh, the political powers and dispensation will always be in favor of that at least till i die if not forever no wild animal species in india and wild animal and bird everything no wild species of india both animate and inanimate including plants should go extinct which is extinction is forever no parks and sanctuaries be denotified and as a concomitant to that the wildlife protection act which is one of the better things i've done in life should be strengthened and not weakened period the conversion of the emphasis from conservation in the wild to conservation and captivity not for as a, as a supplement to conservation in the wild but as an end in itself to divert attention of the people which is happening i believe in ex situ in situ conservation and ex situ conservation should be subservient 
two in situ and not the other way around. Unless the people are mobilized, unless there is a demand, like some communities are. I have written a very, uh, my, my first book I wrote a chapter on sentiment, religious sentiment and wildlife. We in India are unique in this. There are very few other countries outside the Indian subcontinent where religious sentiment. That has saved much more than any government law. So that has to be honored because they, the people want it. And in democracy, if the people say, ye nahi kar sakte, the politician will follow suit. Otherwise, it's always politics.